Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's, it's nice that we didn't have to worry about flooding, huh? <laughs> I kept thinking, oh, gee, if that forecast comes, what's going to happen tonight, and is this going to have to be rescheduled? And I, I'm actually very happy to be here because, as Camille knows, she approached me quite some time ago to see if I could speak, and I do a lot of traveling. I was in Washington, D.C. earlier this week, Pittsburgh. Last week, I'll be um, traveling a lot, and we set this date, and I was so happy when she checked back with me that it's like, this still works, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm also happy to have quite a bit of time to spend with you, because I do talk. I talk all over the world. I talk all over the state. And sometimes I'm given 10 minutes to talk about something really, really complicated and important. And it's like, gee, it's hard to even get started in 10 minutes, let alone really cover something. Sometimes I'm given 20 minutes and 30 minutes. And, and so here I'm given a little bit more time, but I want to make sure that we have a lot of time for questions. When we were talking about what we should title this, there's, there's, there's some very basic things we could talk about. And we decided to use this title, How Full Is Our Water Glass? And I've used this before in some community presentations. And I'm not going to answer the question for you. I'm going to let you think about it. And after you hear some things and ask some questions, let you maybe decide. You see I have that graphic in the front there of a glass half full and half empty. Because the answer is we're somewhere between full and empty, but exactly where you'd say we are, where I'd say we are, kind of depends upon the, the, the day and my mood. But I wanted to start by asking you a few questions related to another fundamental question is, where does our water come from, right? Sometimes people say, well, it comes from the tap, right? I turn it on and it's there and that's where the water comes from. So I wanted to ask you, um, how many of you are Tucson water customers? Okay. How many of you own your own wells? Nobody. Okay, there's a lot of people who own their own wells. Some of you customers of Metro Water District? If you're not Tucson water customers, tell me who you're customers of. Some just... Morana. Morana? Oral Valley? Um, you do have some Oral Valley? Okay, these are... Tucson water serves about 80% of our metropolitan region's population, and some of the other larger providers are the ones that have come up, Marana, Oro Valley, Metro Water District, there's Vale Water for people who live on the east side, Green Valley has some companies. Um, some of these are publicly owned and operated, some are private, so we have a mix here. But then let me ask you the follow-up question about where does your water come from, and that is, what do you think the source of your water is that's delivered to you? Do you know? Did you read your bill inserts? I have to say, I don't read them all the time. Um, but are, are, we getting, are we using groundwater? How many think we're using groundwater? Some. Some. What else are we using? CAB, Central Arizona Project Water. I'll talk a little bit about how we're using that. What about recycled water? Are we using recycled water? It's being used to water the golf course right here at the country club. So the little purple warning things. So knowing where your water comes from, I think, as you learn more about water, will maybe make you think a little bit when you use it. And, and I'm going to get into some of these issues. So I'm, I'm going to talk, and I have to make sure that I press the right slide button here because it's a little different from what I usually use, and I pressed it too hard. All right, just a little bit about the Water Resources Research Center. This is my unpaid advertisement for the Water Resources Research Center. We are part of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. We're celebrating our 50th year, our 50th anniversary this year. We're part of a national network of water centers and institutes that's authorized by the federal government to do water research and water information transfer outreach. And we're located on Campbell Avenue just south of 6th Street. So we're just slightly off campus near the stadium. And we're in the old Boy Scouts building. And where do we have about two guys in the room here? 
three. Um, the, the model of the Boy Scouts is, anybody know? Be prepared. Well, I think that's a really good building for us to be in that has on that stone out in the front the motto be prepared because we do have to be prepared for our water resources. So that's just kind of happenstance that that's where we are. Um, I have our website up here. I have my email address on the first slide. Camille, if you post these, which you're welcome to do. If people want to find out more about water, we have a lot of publications. We have a way you can sign up for our free uh, newsletter. If some of you are really interested and you want to know about our seminars, we have a weekly wave that we put out. So if, if you're interested in, in further information, please go visit our website or you can email me. So part of my theme this evening is going to be about what are our issues that we're facing? What are the challenges we face? What are some of the solutions? And I'm going to do it at a couple of different levels. I'm going to do it, I'm going to try to talk some about the local level, but a lot of the, the issues that we're dealing with here in Tucson, in Arizona, in the Colorado River Basin, there are issues that we share around the world. And this photo is uh, one I like to show because this was taken in, in March 2012. Every three years, there's an international world water forum. And the focus was on solutions. And this is a, a panel that had people from four different countries of the five people talking about challenges of how we manage our water resources. And some of the people there were representing countries and places with abundant water resources. They just sometimes have different problems. It might be water quality problems rather than water quantity problems. By the way, another question for you. Do you know for how many years the Colorado River Basin has been in drought conditions? Can you guess? More than 10. No, less than, it's about 14 going on 15 years now. So uh, we're in the, in the middle of a drought and the, there's climate variability, climate change, things changing for us, and we don't know when we'll come out of the drought. And I've got to tell you, even if we got the five inches of rainfall, which would have been devastating for us, for our infrastructure and handling it, we'd still be in a drought. So I um, wanted you to keep that in mind, that these are some long-term issues that we're dealing with. Oh, I knew I would go the wrong way. So here is what I call my issues and challenges slide. But then more recently I added the word solutions to it because some of our problems are related to our solutions. And so I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I'm going to mention a couple of them. The first one being growth and the need for supplies to accommodate that growth, to meet the needs of that growth, and the competition for water resources that results from that growth. Uh, I mentioned already drought. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, well, I'll talk about transboundary issues in a while. The issues relating to water quality. Most of us here who work on water resources in, in Tucson and in the region, our focus is always quantity, quantity, quantity. But you know, we have to meet drinking water quality standards. And we have to worry about the standards of the water coming out of our wastewater treatment plants that are being discharged into the river or being reused for irrigating golf courses. And a big issue is, should we or will we be reusing that water for drinking purposes in the not too distant future? That's, a, that's an issue before us and many others in water scarce areas. And in all these issues, there's a lot of uncertainty. We just don't know when the drought will end, or we don't know um, certain things about pharmaceutical residuals that's in the wastewater. And so we're dealing and we're planning often with uh, under conditions of uncertainty. So there are lots of people working on these issues all the time. Water becomes an all-consuming endeavor when you get working in the water field. And as Camille uh, indicated, I didn't start out being a water person. I, I'm an economist by training. I studied government tax and expenditure behavior, and I kind of fell into this water stuff. And once you get into it, it's, it's really all-consuming. So I want to remind you, 
all of you, at some point in your lives, you took a science class, you learned the basic fact that no new water is created, right? It can change form, location, quality. But we have to live within our, our water means. So that context, the water cycle context, we have to remember. And I like showing this graph, but I don't think the laser pointer is working. But this, I like this graphic a lot because it shows the over on your left hand side, the little blow up there shows an aquifer. That's where the groundwater is. And the groundwater is not some pristine lake that just happens to be underground. It's water that's interspersed with sand and gravelly materials that we're pulling out. And in a few minutes with another slide, I'll talk to you to what extent we rely on, on groundwater. So I want you to remember that. And then I want you to think as we talk through some of these things, the geographic context that we're in. So this graphic shows that shaded area is the Colorado River Basin, seven states, and the Republic of Mexico share water from the Colorado River. And if you see the shading, Arizona is kind of like the whole of Arizona is in the Colorado River Basin. And, and we're sharing water with states. Um, we've, we've got an over-allocated river. The, the divvying up of the quantity of the river was done in the 1920s based on historical records that the tree ring studies done by some of the great scientists uh, at the University of Arizona have shown was like the wettest period on record. I mean, what's the luck of that, you know? I mean, they didn't know that, but they divvied up the water based on the wettest period of time. And the tree rings have shown that the, the expected average annual flow, and I'm gonna use some numbers here, they divvied it up basically 17.5 million acre feet, which is a lot of water. And the tree ring records show that average over time, if you take the droughts and the floods and all, is maybe 15 million acre feet. So we're starting out over allocated. So we've got that. And here are just some other graphics uh, of, of the Colorado River Basin. The one on your right shows Los Angeles area, if you look at over to, to the Los Angeles area, you see that crosshatch area. Los Angeles is actually outside the boundaries of the Colorado River Basin, but they use Colorado River water that's transported there. Same thing with Denver. Denver is to the east of the basin's boundaries up there in, 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 in the upper right or middle right, but they divert water. So the Colorado River is serving people in these seven states and in Mexico, and there's not as much as people thought there would be, and the region's growing into the supplies, we have drought, and then in 2012, the Bureau of Reclamation, which actually manages the river, uh, because it's a shared river because, between among states, the federal government plays a key role in that, the Secretary of the Interior and then delegates to the Bureau of Reclamation, undertook, uh, pursuant to some federal authorizing legislation, a study of the basin to look at, so what do we expect is going to happen out in 2060, 50 years from 2012? And they work with all the states, and they looked at projections of water supply under different conditions, water demands, not expecting the Colorado River was actually going to meet all that, but what they found is for the region overall, there's a huge projected gap between the supplies and the demands. And so the question is, for us here locally, as we grow into our supplies for the state of Arizona, for the Colorado River Basin, is how do we, how do we balance that? How do we meet those needs? And this, I, I, sometimes we refer to ourselves as water wonks, and this is getting a little wonky here because I took a quote out of an actual Central Arizona Project um, report, but um, the board of the Central Arizona Project, in which I serve, uh, meets monthly and we get reports on the state of the Colorado River and this happened to be a little bit longer report that was shared with some of our congressional delegation and we started seeing in print words like structural deficit, you know, this gap between supply and demand 
And that if steps are not taken in the next few years to correct the structural deficit, there is increased likelihood of conflict among the basin states. Now, the basin states aren't always the best of pals, but, but they actually have been working together really well and have been trying to collectively figure out how to address certain issues. But fundamentally, there are people with more senior priority and, and less senior priority, and there are a lot of issues to work through. And with this continuing drought, it's, it's, it's pushing us to the point where we might ha actually have an official shortage. And it, it, some people, particularly agriculture in central Arizona, will feel the pressures of that. And we're going to, again, have to look at, at solutions. Now, one other thing, I'm not going to spend my whole evening here showing you maps, but I do want to show you this one. And that is the importance of, uh, or underscoring the importance of sharing borders. And it, I showed you the map showing the different states. We have the different states sharing borders and waters. We have between US and Mexico, and it's not just surface water that we share, it's groundwater as well. And you know, the Colorado River, like the Mississippi River, flows from north to south. But we have rivers like the Santa Cruz River that flows from south to north, and the San Pedro River and crosses boundaries. And then we also share borders with Indian nations. And Indian nations have sovereignty when it comes to managing water resources, and that's very important too. We've had uh, Indian water rights claims and settlements. And so this map shows um, in the goldish color various Indian nation lands in Arizona. And just saying, just to give you an idea of just the complexity of all the different issues that, that we're dealing with. And, and there's the book that was mentioned earlier about shared borders, shared waters um, in the context of both our Colorado River Basin and Israel-Palestine. So we have challenges. There are many. And we have some solutions. And, and actually, we're doing very well here. You know, I think I don't want you to go home alarmed about water resources, but I hope maybe I'll excite you about water resources. So, because if, if we don't get excited about it, if the public doesn't realize that addressing some of these issues will take some investment, some long term planning, we could find ourselves in a situation like. Um, California has found itself in where they've had tremendous cutbacks and in fact because of that they've just passed a very important piece of groundwater legislation but it might have been better had they done that several years before and in our case we know that there are some things we have to look at over time and it's not easy getting to yes or getting to the to the uh, agreement on these things and so what we see in fact is a, is a reflection of, of some of these different things I've listed, listed here, including politics and public values. Um, th these are just some of the important factors that affect what, what we see practice. So let me just give you a, a bit of a snapshot about Arizona, and then I want to talk to about Tucson a little bit, and then I'll, I'll bring it up um, to the state level, and then maybe a little bit to um, some of these solutions. So, I, I use the term million. I use the term acre feet. An acre foot is the amount of water that covers an acre of land about one foot deep. It's about 326,000 gallons. We're the only country in the world that talks about acre feet. And in fact, it's really just the West that talks about acre feet. <laughs> Everywhere, because it's agriculture. You know, the West was built on agriculture and these pro projects. Other places, it's cubic meters. You know, they use metric in other parts of the world. And so um, often I have this slide where I have in parentheses all the metrics that go with the million acre feet. I don't expect you, and I know that Camille has this little test for you that. Um, I'm not going to give you a test at the end of this and ask you to remember these numbers. But, but what I want you to do is think about like some of these percentages. Water use is estimated in the state to be about 7 million acre feet. And the reason it's estimated is we don't measure everything. So not everywhere is it measured or reported. Some of it's estimated. And statewide, about 40% of that is groundwater. 
is, is legally considered groundwater. Some areas are dependent 100% on groundwater. And then some areas are dependent very little, like the city of Phoenix is dependent very little on groundwater. About 3%, that number is a little fuzzy, but some percentage of it is recycled water. And a large component of that is for um, irrigation of golf courses, ball fields, cemeteries. But I don't know how many of you know that the Palo Verde nuclear power plant in Phoenix area, west of Phoenix, the cooling water for that power plant is recycled water coming from the metropolitan Phoenix area. That plant is the largest um, inland nuclear power plant. I think that's still correct. And that means it's not by a body of water. Most of nuclear power plants are by a body of water for the cooling needs. And in this case, recycled water is used. And then the remaining use is surface water. Either water along the main stem of the Colorado River on our western boundary, water delivered to Central Arizona through the Central Arizona Project, the Salt River Project. I heard somebody talking earlier that she's from Phoenix. How many of you grew up or lived in the Phoenix area? Yeah, I saw it behind. Not too many, but, but you know, the Salt River Project is a major provider of, of water in the Phoenix area, a wholesaler. And that water is surface water that comes from the Salt and, and, and Verde Rivers. And that's a component of, uh, of the rest. So that, I'm going to show you a pie chart in a minute, but that's kind of where, where the sources are. Who uses it? Again, some of the measurements, some of the definitions are, are a little difficult. About 70% of water is diverted or extracted by agriculture. Notice I didn't use the word used, because some of that water that's applied to fields ends up finding its way back to rivers and streams and the ground. So that's what they take off of the surface supplies or pull, pull from the ground. I'll show you a pie chart that shows the other percentages in a minute. We have a system whereby we regulate groundwater. I just told you, California, just this week, the governor signed, just yesterday, the day before, uh, a groundwater management uh, law. We in Arizona passed the Groundwater Management Act in 1980. We are at the forefront of groundwater management in the country. And that's been a very important part of, of our being able to accommodate our growth. But that, that groundwater is, is managed only in certain areas called active management areas. And that we have a different way of how we manage surface water and groundwater. I mean, it's really, you know, not even the lawyers who study the laws all the time can really keep up with all of these different aspects. And that's with all due respect. Any lawyers in the room? Full respect for lawyers. Um, I've got to just tell you, I have lawyers calling me, and I'm not a lawyer. You're a law professor. <laughs> well, um, with questions about it. It's just because it's so complicated. So someone might tend to be a surface water expert, groundwater, and it's changing all the time. But, but um, it, it's, it's complicated. Here's just some pie charts that just show the green is agriculture in the top. Municipal is the, the, the part that's growing the most because of more people and more needs. We have industrial use, and then we have use by natural systems, by natural areas, environmental water use. That's not really measured in our, in our state. So that's why on that, on that slide there, there's that little wedge for the environment. We're not sure exactly what that quantity is. How about mining? Mining goes in industrial. All right, so what goes into industrial is use by uh, electricity generation, uh, mining. It could be sand and gravel mining, not only copper mining. Interestingly enough, uh, anybody here from the ranching, cattle growing, dairy industry? Um, the use of water for cows, for cattle, for, you know, there's a lot of water use in dairy operations. That's considered an industrial use as opposed to agricultural. But of course, the water used to grow the alfalfa to feed the animals is an agricultural use. So sometimes, again, you have to get a little bit into the details. Um, but, but industrial is, is in, in that pink, pink portion of the pie there. And then this just breaks down the water supplies um, a little bit more. 
And then this is just another map. I, I said I was going to show you more maps, but I lied. Uh, this is a map showing the active management areas in the state, which cover most of our population centers. They start down in the Santa Cruz AMA, go up through Tucson, Casa Grande, up into Phoenix, and then Prescott. And those are the areas where in the late 70s and before that, there was a, a serious problem of groundwater overdraft. You know, after World War II and with the advent of high capacity pumps and air conditioning and the growth of population, uh, there was a lot of groundwater pumping going on and overdraft. And the Groundwater Management Act, now you might think, well, Arizona did a great thing. Why did it do that? How did it come together to do something as different and significant as the Groundwater Management Act, it was because the then Secretary of the Interior, it was the Carter administration, they didn't like Western Water Project so much, and they said, if you want your Central Arizona project funded, we have to have some assurance that you're just not going to waste and use more water. You've got to do something about that groundwater that you're using, because this really, if it's going to be a substitute for groundwater use, we want to, we want to see that that's going to be the case. And that's really um, what led to the adoption of the, the Groundwater Management uh, Act and these active management areas. The other little cur colored areas are called irrigation non-expansion areas, and those are areas that had some, some groundwater problems such that they didn't want agriculture to expand its footprint beyond where it already was, but these are not highly populated areas where there had to be a lot of additional um, controls on, on, regu on, on um, groundwater use. So that's kind of where we're at. And we've really done, this gets to the half full, half empty, or how full, how empty. We've really done some very innovative things here. We, I've mentioned already the Groundwater Management Act. We got the Central Arizona project built. That was no simple feat to get it authorized, get it funded. Even the challenge of authorization, one of the reasons why watching the Colorado River levels, looking at whether a shortage has to be declared is so significant for us is that the deal we had to strike politically, remember I said what we see with water depends on politics as one of those factors, in order to get the project, the building of the Central Arizona Project authorized in the House of Representatives of the United States, we had to agree that in times of shortage, the Central Arizona Project would be shorted completely before California experienced any shortage. And so they have a more senior right so if we have a shortage declared, it's, we have triggers and guidelines and amounts and everything else, but it's the water delivered to the Central Arizona Project that gets hit first, along with a few others. Las Vegas gets a little hit and some others in Arizona. And then within the Central Arizona Project, we have different priorities. And some of the non-Indian agricultural use is the lowest priority. So remember a few minutes ago I said, there could be some really trying times for Central Arizona agriculture if a shortage is declared because they're going to be the ones hit first. And the question is, will they go back on groundwater, which they have the legal right to do, the Groundwater Management Act allows them to? Will they switch to different irrigation methods? Will they switch crops? Will they fallow their lands? What, what will we do? What will they do? We don't, we don't know yet. But We've, we've done a lot on, on the groundwater management and conservation programs. We've got the Central Arizona Project built. In the active management areas, we require new growth to show that it has an assured water supply. So there, part of what led to the big problems was uh, dry lot uh, subdivisions. People were able to just sell properties without there being sufficient water. And, the purchasers of the property were left holding the bag on that. Um, and, and, and so this assured water supply program requires the, the development to show, or the city or water company providing water to that development, that there's physically, legally, continuously available water for 100 years. Yes? Water supply 
So that's a great question. And um, yeah, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you evidence of how there's no simple answer to questions um, about water. Yeah, yeah, well, I've hung around with enough lawyers, so. Um, but lawyers don't make good witnesses, you know, I've got to tell you that, because I've actually seen lawyers try to be witnesses in administrative hearings. Oh, I'm on tape, I guess I shouldn't have said that. But, uh, so there's, there's a couple dimensions to, to answering that question. First of all, the assured water supply rules apply to the active management areas only. Outside the active management areas, what is required is a showing of adequate supply. And historically, there could be a finding of inadequate supply or not a finding of adequate supply. And the development could go forward and can still go forward in, in several of the counties. And all the, the, the seller of the properties or the lots had to do was to the first purchaser say there was a finding of inadequate water supply or not an adequate water supply. And nothing had to be provided to the subsequent purchasers of the property. And as I like to say, these days we all know what we mean by font size. There was no font size requirement of how big that had to be. And you know, think about buying a property and all the things you have to read and, and look at. So to this day, you know, this isn't exactly your question, but there is the potential for the, there to be a finding of inadequate water supply and the sale of the properties to still go on outside the AMAs. Now, typically that doesn't happen. There have been instances where the department, um, and there's one that I think of, I'm not going to mention it by name, because, no, no, it's not even near here. Um, <laughs> it's not, because we are we have to have a short water supply here. But where there were concerns, and what the Department of Water Resources will do then often is say, why don't you come back with a revised plan of maybe how many houses you expect to build, or maybe how you're going to utilize that water. You know, maybe there were three golf courses when golf courses were, you know, uh, let's say more popular than they are to developments. They might say cut cut back a golf course, and and um, they would possibly come back with a revised plan to avoid that. But I will tell you that there's. There's been an, an instance, and, and there may be more than this, but this is one that I'm aware of, where in order to demonstrate um, an assured water supply, uh, part of the Cave Creek, North Scottsdale area, had to enter into an arrangement with uh, a component of the Central Arizona project to get some water delivered to it, because they couldn't show physical availability of that water under the ground, and they didn't necessarily have a contract um, in the, the smaller part of the community for that surface water supply. So there are instances where a study may show that there isn't adequate, let's say, groundwater to serve the development, and then they'll go find some way to, to address that. But to make it even more complicated, um, the physical availability, many of, I asked you earlier, what water are you using, right? And many of you, if not most all of you, recognize that you're using water from the Central Arizona Project, Colorado River water. But how is that delivered to you? Do you know? It's not delivered to you through a treatment plant. We tried that. How many of you lived here in the early 1990s? You know that? Um, we tried that. It didn't work. For us, there was a problem. And it got us all spooked about treatment and direct delivery. And that's how they use a lot of it in the Phoenix area. They were used to using surface water up there from the Salt River Project. It wasn't such a big change for them to introduce another surface supply like it was for us here. And how we're using it is through this system. And it's one of these here underground storage and recovery program on my list where, and I have some photos, I was planning to talk about this, where we're taking that surface water, we're putting it in recharge basins, we're letting it infiltrate, and then we're, it's mixing with groundwater, and then we're recovering it. This is how Tucson Water is using its Central Arizona Project water. In Marana and Oro Valley, 
they're recharging their central Arizona and, and metro water district. Miranda doesn't have that much central Arizona project water. Um, they have, all of them have some contracted amounts. They're recharging it, but they're actually not withdrawing their water, water in the same area in which they're recharging. So they're actually serving you groundwater, but legally, a good portion of that is considered surface water because they get these credits for the recharge and then they withdraw. It's almost like a bank. You talked about financial management. I mean, maybe you folks want to take a look at um, how we're doing in our, in our water resources here and how our bank account's looking. Because we do allow people to talk about physical availability if they go as low as 1,000 feet below land surface. And that's a really, really long way to pump if anybody goes there. So long answer to your question, but it got me to say some things that I wanted to say. And that is, we're using these surface supply waters here in the Tucson area indirectly. And this assured water supply program is a very, very serious thing. Um, it should give people comfort that in order to serve the new growth, there's been a showing, but the issues are kind of in the future as we continue to grow, and you, you, you have to re-up that showing. You have to modify as your population grows and establish that you have an assured water supply. So I am going to move on. Um, and, and I'm going to start skipping some slides, but here are some photos about this artificial recharge, we call it, where we're deliberately putting water on your left into basins and let it infiltrate in the middle photo. Anybody have an idea, guess, where that photo may be taken? Now, where that's taken is pretty close to the Aver Valley Road Bridge. Wow. That's treated wastewater that's discharged. This is a couple years old. We have a new treatment plant. But that was basically discharged from the Ina Road treatment plant. And one of the ways we recharge is just through kind of natural stream bed infiltration. And there's a system. It's a highly regulated system of, of, of credits. And, and it's very uh, regulated by the Arizona Department of Water Resources. That photo on the right is a photo of a farm field out in the Maricopa Stanfield Irrigation and Drainage District. That happens to be, some people may think we don't use drip irrigation, but that's a drip irrigation field. And there is some drip irrigation in central Arizona. And one of the ways we recharge is by basically not withdrawing water, by providing surface water for agriculture to use in its fields for, for watering and leaving the groundwater in the, in the ground. So we've been innovative in how we approach this. Um, I'm going to skip this slide other than just the middle part of it. And that is, in the 1980 legislation, there were established for each of the active management areas a management goal. And for the Tucson, Phoenix, and Prescott active management areas, the management goal is safe yield. With the goal being, by 2025, to not be withdrawing more groundwater than either nature or artificial means uh, replenish. And and so that's been guiding us. And, and actually, our region, depending upon what numbers you look at when, has been moving toward or actually achieving safe yield. But it needs to stay there. Now, let me just point something out for the skeptics in the audience. Um, and that is, if you read that goal carefully, it says a water management goal which attempts to achieve and thereafter maintain. So, number one, if anybody says, well, how are you doing against your goal? Well, we're attempting, right? <laughs> so, it's hard to show you're not achieving, I mean, attempting. And then it's to achieve and thereafter maintain. And then you might ask the question, so what happens if you don't maintain, even if you achieved it? Well, there's no penalties in the law. And so a big question for people working in water management as we're getting closer and closer to 2025, you know, 1980 is now 35 years ago, just about, is, you know, what do we do if we're not there? You know, that's, that's, that's an issue. So I mentioned that we're using um, our, our Colorado River water through storage and recovery. Um, after the failed attempt to deliver treated uh, Central Arizona project water, there was an initiative passed in, in Tucson that said, 
basically, we want a quality of water that that plant that was built couldn't produce, so we had to go to this plan B. And the plan B is this storage and recovery, and that's just a graphic that shows what we're doing. But I have to tell you that, you know, every cloud has a silver lining, you know, that saying is that as a result of the difficulties we had in the, in the early 90s with the introduction of treated Colorado River water into the Tucson water system, Tucson water had to go to plan B. It's, it's implemented this plan. It's at the point now where it can take its entire sizable allocation of central Arizona project water. It's not using all of it. So some of it's being stored for the future, which is a good thing. And we have actually a much more drought proof system than we might have had before because we've got the wells. We're using wells. They're all operating. It's not like we've mothballed them and we have to worry about if they're going to work, if something interferes with the delivery of the surface water, either due to a really bad extended drought or some kind of outage. We, we did have a situation where there was a, a failure of part of the canal system that I have to give great credit to the Central Arizona Project staff and its contractors. They fixed it real quickly, and there was enough, enough storage in Lake Pleasant that the cities didn't see a blip in their deliveries because it was all taken care of so quickly. But, you know, I don't know how many of you remember about the earthquake in Mexico. I happen to remember the date because it was on my birthday, April 4th. It was April 4, 2010, there was a significant earthquake that damaged the delivery canals that Mexico uses to use its Colorado River water, and that's taking them a long time to be able to fix. So our system is relying on, on water pumped in part from well fields that have a lot of groundwater in storage. I mean, the whole, the whole thrust of our Groundwater Management Act was to leave some of that good quality water in the ground for times of emergency or our insurance policy. And those pictures on the right are just some basins. And every year I do a field trip for my Arizona water policy class. And we go out to one of these basins. And um, Tucson Water gives us all a thrill that they, they were in the dry basin and they turn the water on and come out. So you can see everybody standing around there. And it's really, I mean, when you're a water person, you get really excited about that. Kind of thing. So. Um, I'm just going to mention this really quickly because I'm watching my watch, but we, we try to be innovative and flexible. And we created something in the, about 20 years ago, the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District. I just spent a two-hour meeting today in Phoenix at the committee of the CAP board that deals with this. We have to put together a plan of operation every 10 years. We're going to be approving that plan in November. Very complex. Um, the basic challenge of this is that the, this district, which is part of the CAP, needs to provide the water to replenish the groundwater used by some of this new growth. And so we have to go out and buy these sources of water, and it's, it's a very complex operation that's uh, part, of, part of our responsibility and very important to some of the areas that are not near the Central Arizona Project Canal or don't have a contract to use the water. Um, one thing, just to give you some comfort, again, I'm saying all these things, I'm going to let you go home and decide how you feel about it all, and that is that we created in 1996 an Arizona Water Banking Authority that's been storing water underground for times of shortage that might impact the municipalities. First of all, we don't expect any shortage in any reasonable amount of time that affects the municipalities, but if we do, we've got some water in storage to make up for that. And so we have a, a pretty good system in place for the cities. So we have issues that are outstanding. We've got transboundary issues. I want to just mention that we, we um, have a, a unique organization, the International Boundary and Water Commission. There's a US commissioner and there's a Mexican commissioner. And they deal with issues of uh, transboundary wastewater management. They deal with. Um, cross-border surface water management. And these two individuals, the photo on the right was taking a, taken at my water center. They really like interacting with students, and I've got them to come to my, my class a couple times. 
and they've been doing some really great things, including how many of you read about the historic pulse flow on the Colorado River that um, for the first time in a long, long time helped uh, deliver some water into some of the area in Mexico and down toward the Delta where water hasn't been flowing for a very long time because we're using it all. Um, and we haven't had any really significant floods. And so they've, um, they've been very good about that and this is just some workshop. So I think I'm going to very quickly just talk about, um, I, I do quite a bit of work in, in Israel and some in Jordan. And I've done a little bit in Australia and I really believe that there's a lot that we can learn from each other and by sharing experiences. And for example, I think our model for how we deal with the transboundary issues between the US and Mexico could be something for certain other areas to look at very closely about how they uh, might uh, be able to develop an institution uh, to deal with these transboundary issues. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunity to learn from experiences. And in fact, I've been invited I do quite a bit of, of speaking um, in Israel every year, at least one, but I'm, I'm going to be in October speaking at a conference there on the rehabilitation of the Jordan, Lower Jordan River, and a, a, an emerging project that's a collaboration of Israel and Jordan. And this is brand new. This is just formulating, and they've asked me to come and talk about how we're dealing with certain restoration or enhancement issues in our region because of the recognition of being able to learn. So um, one of the fun things I did, this is not quite in my job description, but I had some people ask me to do this, is I took nine other professionals. I mean, they paid their own way. I didn't take them, but I led them um, <laughs> on a Israel water management program. And, and so they could see firsthand some of the accomplishments as well as some of the challenges in the region. And I'm just going to go really quickly through, some of these were on the issues and challenges. Wastewater treatment and reuse. I've mentioned that already. We have to treat to good standards, and there's an opportunity to reuse it. Uh, Israel's a leader in the world in that. It's used uh, largely for, um, agri by agriculture there. They don't have a lot of golf courses. They have like one. Um, I mean, golf's not a big thing. Uh, but this recharge and recovery that I've talked about, I'm going to give you the punchline of this. This is one of my favorite slides to show, when I'm, especially when I'm dealing with people from Arizona who know about what we're doing in water management. Because I say, here's some recharge basins. Where do you think this slide is? Notice the Coca-Cola sign. Notice the IKEA sign. That's in Israel. IKEA's everywhere, you know. Any of you travel anywhere? I start taking pictures of IKEA in different countries. Uh, but it's the same, we're doing the same thing. So these are kind of proven technologies, if you want. This may be a low tech, but we're using the soils to treat. Agricultural water use efficiency. This is a place where I mentioned drip irrigation. In certain parts of the world, particularly Israel and, and other areas in the Middle East, they're using much more drip irrigation than we are. And, um, there's questions about could we do, do more. Desalination. And we're very interested in desalination in Arizona. And you might say, well, do we have an ocean or sea near us? And we are interested in seawater desalination because there's the potential, we believe, we meaning the water community, that maybe we could help fund some desalination of water for Mexico or California and do an exchange where we take some of their water off the Colorado River. And then there's the issue, issue of um, brackish water, that's highly uh, saline ground water. None of you have your own well, but I've gotten phone calls at the office that says the total dissolved solids coming from our well is some extremely high number. Um, and, and that's not necessarily a health problem, but it sure is a problem for your plumbing and your fixtures and all that to have such a high salt contact. So the issue of, of enhancing the supplies that we could use to meet needs through desalination. Harvesting rainwater. I showed you the picture of the water center in the beginning. We have a, a rainwater barrel out there. We got an internal grant from the U of A. Uh, we hardly have anything to water 
um, we don't have a lot of landscaping, but we, we have it as a demonstration area and we don't use potable water for landscaping. How many of you have active rainwater harvesting systems? Any of you at your homes? And some of you may have passive, where you just have swallows or you know dips where the water is accumulating. This is something that, this is, these are uh, some barrels in a system at a school in central Jerusalem, and they use it there for flushing toilets. We don't always have to use the high quality water for everything. We they match the quality with the use, and rainwater harvesting can help us do that. Gray water systems is another, and here's again where Arizona is a leader. We have some um, a permitting system, allowances in place to use that washing machine water or that sink water um, and use it uh, on our property. This is a, a project that I've been working on with some researchers in Jordan uh, looking at a pilot system to enhance uh, the, the water available for agriculture in the very water scarce uh, Jordan Valley. And then conservation. And this is the, the face of drought that they used in Israel. Um, beautiful face, but very dry, right? Um, but the, the importance of our children and, and the programs that are helping them learn about water. I'm proud that the Water Resources Research Center houses Arizona Project WET, Water Education for Teachers. And this is actually part of a national and even international program where children learn how to look at how much water is being used or wasted on their school properties. And then they go home and they measure and they do math problems at home and figure out how much they might be able to, uh, parents might be able to save on their water bills if they put in the loaf, uh, the aerators on their taps and so forth. So great project, uh, a relay that shows how heavy water is and how you can lose it so quickly. The winner of the relay is the one who gets the most water in the big tub at, at the end of going back and forth. And then environmental issues. Um, in, in the case of Arizona, the law does not provide very much protection of all for natural systems. And that's why we've seen a lot of degradation of our natural streams and rivers. And you know, there's a great book um, that that Camille got uh, as a raffle prize about groundwater that's uh, put together by a an, uh, graphic arts art professor at the University of Arizona. But there's also a very recent book that came out called Requiem for the Santa Cruz River by some people from USGS and others. And it's a beautiful book. We just sponsored a seminar on that. And so the issue of our natural systems, and it is kind of that saying, if you build it, they will come. If you have water, the birds will find it. And the, um, the birding that goes on by Sweetwater Wetlands. Now, how many of you know where Sweetwater Wetlands is? Not that many of you. It's right near where, if you go to that um, I-10 Prince motor vehicle testing place, it's right near there. This was built as a compliance action with ADQ not because we Tucson Water had any big problems, but it wasn't reporting it right or something. And it's a little oasis in the desert. You can just drive there, and it's a great place for birding. It's where people from Audubon will go when they're doing their fundraising. And then a final message has to do with cooperation and stakeholder engagement. And we're all stakeholders when it comes to water. And this issue of um, how do we get to these solutions requires a lot of outreach, a lot of interaction. This happens to be a word cloud that came out of a project some of my staff are working on in looking at what, what is it that you're concerned about, what kinds of words are used, and um, it, it, it takes a lot of resources to actually do the education or do the engagement and get the input, but ultimately um, we need that because the decision makers really will make decisions based on if they're acceptable or not to, the, to their constituents. And so it takes an informed um, citizenry to help arrive at some of these uh, decisions for both the near term, intermediate term, and, and the long term. And so these are, again, messages that come out of I started with a photo of some, uh, a global meeting. This was at the World Water Day in The Hague. 
and March 22nd. And, and two of those individuals, I'll tell you who, um, who these people are, and kind of cut, and this doesn't seem to be working, but at the very lower left, that is a woman who's the president of Liberia. And to her left is the head of UNESCO. And to um, the head of UNESCO, the science part of UNESCO, maybe the science, I, 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 sorry, I'm not remembering exactly, I know her name, the right title. Um, to the next, to her left, is, that person is currently the king of the Netherlands. He was the crown prince at that time, and he was chairing a UN advisory committee on water and wastewater. And to his left is His Royal Highness Prince El Hassan bin Talal of Jordan, who was the vice chair of that committee at the time. And so these are very high level, important people who are there talking about the importance of cooperation, the importance of, of addressing the water challenges of the world. And let me just bring it back to home because you know, we're all very fortunate here. I mean, we do have running water 24 seven. We have good quality water. Not everybody even in Arizona does. 30 to 35% of the Navajo Nation does not have plumbing. You know, they're, they're transporting their water. Uh, many parts, you know, I've mentioned Jordan. In, in places, even a major city like Amman, there's not necessarily 24-7. There's storage facilities, so there'll be, if you go there and you stay in a hotel, it's like any other hotel in the world, try to go in some bathrooms outside the hotel. They're, they're, they're quite different. So these issues, again, these are the commonality of issues.